Welcome to Women of Courage, where you will hear the stories of courageous women, women from all walks of life who have faced life challenges along the path of their life journey, women who have tapped into their inner resources and found the courage to confront, to overcome, and to triumph. I'm Ann Miner, your host for the show, and my guests have all agreed to share their experiences so others may learn from them. It's my hope that these stories will inspire you, that knowing that you are not alone in facing the bumpy road of life, you will be motivated to keep moving, that you will take action and courageously pursue your own dreams and passions, no matter what obstacles are presented along the way. Just as our Women of Courage have won over their challenges, you can too. Stay with us. We'll be back with today's Women of Courage in just a moment. If I were brave, we believe that where you watch TV should be up to you. With Rogers Any Place TV, you can watch more TV shows right on your smartphone. Whether it's kids' programs, exclusive content, live sports, or primetime shows, Rogers Any Place TV gives you up to 45 live and on-demand channels right on your smartphone, leaving the choice of where to watch TV entirely up to you. Download the Rogers Any Place TV mobile app from your app store and start watching today. So you want to score one of those slick Nextbox 2.0 HD PBRs for free? You know, the one you can manage from your tablet? Here's what you do. Next time you watch the OHL playoffs on Rogers TV, grab the passcode, punch it in the contest page, and boom, you're entered. Got it? Netbox 2.0 HD PBR. OHL playoffs on Rogers TV. Passcode, contest page, enter, boom. Oh, and good luck. The Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada is an awesome resource just for the simple fact that they have clubs in almost every province. They have clubs in almost every city. There's always a place where children can go and build relationships with people in their community or people outside of their community. If you start with children, then our communities can affect change in the world. <laughs> today is Christine Smith. Welcome Christine. Thanks for having me. You're so, I am so looking forward to hearing your story. I know that you've faced many challenges and it's taken great courage for you to overcome them. So why don't you give us a little bit of background? Certainly. My story actually I'd like to go back about over 17 years ago. Just living a regular life working, husband working, daughter was about six years old at the time so she would have been in school. Um, I started to be tired at work and I thought well maybe I can get some testing done so I had some blood work and things done and through that I found out that I needed to go to a specialist for my kidneys. Mm. So when I went to find out uh, he said yes I have a kidney disease it's actually called IgA nephropathy is the type of the disease that I have. So because we were still a young family and I wanted to have another child um, he decided that maybe I should have a biopsy. So I went in and had a biopsy done and found out that I was down to already just 50% of my kidney function. So wow. even though it was there, he said I could still go ahead, you know, live a normal life. He had mm -hmm. no idea it could be a year from now that I would have uh, renal failure or it could be 30 plus years. So we thought, well, we'll still continue to see if I can have another child. So lo and behold, we did. Mm -hmm. Although Joshua was born at the eight months. He was one month premature. And actually I found out that just by going for my regular eight month checkup. And when I was there, they found out that he was in distress. So right away I was in the hospital and had an ultrasound. It was like, oh Lord. So he was born by cesarean section <laughs> emergency. Mm -hmm. But he's nice and healthy now, 16 years of age. Um, unfortunately, the day that we had him, we also found out that my husband's plant was closing. Oh my so goodness. another setback <laughs> was that uh, he was not going to have a job. So, um, I mean, we bring him home and he looks for work. We didn't find anything local, so we did have to move. So we moved to Tottenham. 
which is a nice little place. Um, again, my kidneys were fine. I just had to go to the regular doctors and I had um, medication that I had to take. And um, jo uh, Jessica was in school. Uh, I even started a part-time job. I looked after Joshua, different mm -hmm. things like that. Then we had another setback. The plant that my husband was working for was downsizing. Yeah. So again, I was working part time, so that was helpful in that sense. But uh, again, so he had to look for work again, which brought us to Ingersoll. So <laughs> we've done a few moving around, uh, which isn't too bad. You get to meet a lot of different people that way. We did even actually live out west for a short period of time, but uh, that was even before the period of time for my health. Um, but when we moved to Ingersoll, I found, I don't know if it was stress that was happening, but I started to get an anxiety attacks to the point that I couldn't drive. So it was kind of hard not being able to drive, but I forced myself because I thought, you know, we live out in rural areas. I had to stay with, um, my family lived with my girlfriend and her husband and family for the first couple of months because we couldn't move into our home yet and just by the way the sales of homes went and stuff like that. So they were, I mean, wonderful people to do that for us, you know. Mm -hmm. Bring on four more people <laughs> to the household, right? <laughs> it was a lot of stress. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I mean, you, you get through the anxiety parts. I did go see the doctor for it and that thing, and I had it for a while, and um, I found that I didn't necessarily want to go to work full time, but that's when I decided to try that entrepreneur spirit of mine again. So uh, I did a couple of um, um, business jobs, which also gave me the flexibility so that if I had bad days when I got up, that it was better. Because as we progressed further on, and I'm talking now uh, about five years ago, my kidneys were starting to get worse. Mm. So I was seeing the doctor more regularly, and uh, they would keep an eye on me and see how things were. Of course, all of a sudden, all these healthy foods that you can eat, I could not eat. I could not have potassium, so bananas that I like to have almost every day, <laughs> I could <laughs> no, no longer have. Mm -hmm. uh, calcium, so I was allowed not even, you know, a little tiny bit of milk each day, because what happens is, because my kidneys weren't functioning properly, they couldn't push all that out anymore, so I had to be very careful as to the amount I could have. So. Tomatoes, I mean, all these healthy things that you could have, I couldn't have at this time. Things we don't even think about. Anymore. No, mm -hmm. and so I was pretty good at sticking to it because I knew that was something I had to do if I wanted to prolong my kidneys as far as I could. Now, um, a couple of years later on, I started to get restless legs. I never knew what restless legs were before, and believe me, you do not want to have <laughs> restless legs. Um, some people have them in the evening, and that's when it started for me, but then I started to get them all day long. Well, tell us what that is. It's just this feeling you get in your legs that you can't sit still. It's, it's not an itchy feeling, but it's just a creepy feeling, and you always have to move your legs around, and you just can't, so I would get up all the time. So I spent a lot of time being up and about. Things like going to the show. I didn't really want to do because it was too hard. Mm -hmm. um, being in a car for a certain length of time would start to bother my legs, so I'd be sitting in the car, moving around. And was that and something related to the kidney? I did find out that some people can have it if they don't have a problem, but um, through a friend and through the doctor, they said, well, chances are that once you get uh, on dialysis or get a transplant, that that will go away. So I was thinking, well, I'd like it to go away now because <laughs> I couldn't do the things. Now, they did give me at least a medication so that I could sleep. Mm -hmm. So at least I was sleeping. But the good thing was I got my house all painted. I did a lot of gardening <laughs> and a lot of on the days that I could, right. of course. But it, it sort of kept you going. But um, then what happened as we get closer to my kidneys getting a little worse, I had to go for some classes, which is an excellent thing that they have at the London Hospital for kidney patients. They have classes that you can go to to find out what's happening to you and then what type of dialysis choices that you can have because there is more than one mm -hmm. and then to tell you what happens when you get to the transplant stage. 
So that was excellent to have that, that portion. You so you yes. know what to expect. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was really good. And mm -hmm. the, and my doctor and, and they would tell me, you know, the things that I needed to know, things that would help, and different things like that. But when it did get a little closer and the doctor felt that I was getting close to the dialysis point, I went for a day surgery and had what they call a peritoneal catheter in place. So I actually have a little hole underneath <laughs> my navel and that's where they put the catheter in place and they just put it underneath the skin so I would have it there for when they were ready to start dialysis. So in anticipation. Okay. So yeah, at this point I'm anticipating, yes, it's going to happen. So of course you have a lot of, not just self-doubt, but I mean, I'm, I'm a religious person, spiritual, I prayed a lot, but you really get to the point where you're thinking, why me, why me? Because it's really starting to get to the point where I'm going to have to go on dialysis. And even if I do peritoneal, it's at night or during the day. Yes, I don't have to probably go to the hospital and spend three days a week, like I know a lot of people do have to do. But I thought, it's still, you know. And then you start to think about your life more and things like that too, because you have young kids and, and things like that. So you're, you're really starting to think, wow, something could change different. But um, fortunately for me, they started a program at the hospital that you could be on the transplant list if you were getting to the point of dialysis, but not on dialysis mm -hmm. yet. So that was in the spring of 2009 that I was put on the transplant list. So then I was just like the doctor or all those people who have to carry a pager around everywhere I go, because if I'm not home, they will page me to oh, tell me that I have to come in. More stress. So you can't go too far away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Christine, I'm going to get you to hold that thought because we're, we're just going to have uh, a few more minutes. And I think what we'll do just, in, just at this moment is we'll go to a break. Okay. And when we come back, you can tell us more. Okay, great. Right? Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment with more of Christine's story. If I were brave, One of Woodstock's most recognizable landmarks is the old town hall building, now known as the Woodstock Museum. It was built in 1853 in the Italianated style which was very popular in Britain at the time. The building was multifunctional, with a market on the first floor and a grand assembly hall on the second. The hall was rented out for dances, concerts, meetings, and public entertainments, and was the setting for the infamous Birchall Benwall murder trial. It was also used as the meeting place for town council, and a small office was provided for the mayor. As the town grew, the market moved to the adjacent building, and more offices and a council chambers were installed. In 1965, the town hall faced demolition, and Bernadette Smith, six-time mayor of Woodstock, spearheaded a campaign to save and preserve the building. Since then, decades of meticulous conservation have ensured that this this treasured landmark, now designated a National Historic Site, will remain a vital community museum for years to come. Gate Burke is a safe place to participate in physical outdoor activities. I'm Jed Lau, host of Simply Cooking. as we continue our conversation with Christine Smith. So Christine, thanks for telling us so far the challenges. We can't wait to hear the next step on your story. <laughs> it's sure been really challenging up to this point. It does get better, because <laughs> at this point in 2009, of course I'm carrying the pager. I was allowed to go you know, an hour or two away, so I could still visit family and things like that. I just couldn't go for a long holiday or anything like that, but mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, then in December of 2009, on the 18th, I was at home. My daughter was at home. My oh, husband had right just left Christmas. for work. Yeah, yeah, just before Christmas. I get a phone call. I just put hair dye in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the hospital calling me saying, we have a match. I was like, um, 
okay. I'm like, and she's saying, well, do you want to come in? Because they have to give you the choice still whether you still want to come in. I'm mm -hmm. like, of course. Because I'm like, okay, where am I right now? I'm thinking, um, well, do I have to be there right away? And they said, no, no, you can have a little bit of time. I says, well, because I have hair dye in my <laughs> hair. And my husband just left for work, so I have to call him and get him to come home. And they said, okay, be at the hospital as soon as you can. I said, well, I think we can probably be there for around three o'clock. So I'm like, oh, I get off the phone. And of course, I'm telling Jessica, because actually I thought maybe it might have been a phone call for her, because she was deciding to try and see if she could be a match for a kidney mm. for me, which uh, was, you know, so we figured maybe that was her for going in for her first time to see. But it wasn't, so I waited for my husband to come home, and we packed up my bag. Now, my daughter stayed home uh, for when Joshua was going to come home, too. So my two kids stayed home, and we went to the hospital. And I have to tell you, on the way to the hospital, I'm very anxious about it, and I'm, you know, happy and excited. But at the same time, all I could think about was the donor family, mm. knowing that they had lost someone, and yet here I was going to get what I needed to have. So it, it played a little bit. And then when we got to the hospital, they weren't ready for me yet. They didn't have a room, so we mm. spent a lot of time waiting around. <laughs> and then, so, I mean, we get to the hospital like three or four in the afternoon. I think it was like 11 o'clock by the time I got in, up into my room. Uh, when I did, we had to find out first if the kidneys were compatible, because there was a gentleman in front of me. And if he needed both of them, he was going to get both. We found out that they were both okay, so he went in first, so it was like in the middle of the morning, I went in for my four, I think it was four or five hour surgery. Of course, I'm out, so I'm good to go. <laughs> my husband's yes. there with me. Um, so I wake up in the morning, you know, droggy and things like that for medication, and I've heard some stories about me being kind of <laughs> but Right from the get-go, my kidney that I was given worked excellent. I had no problems whatsoever. I was in the hospital for just over a week. That was it. I was so happy to get home. So does that mean that you got home for Christmas? I did get home <laughs> for Christmas. I got home, I can't remember now whether it was the Monday or the Tuesday, and actually that Saturday we celebrated Christmas at our house with my family. Wow. Because it was already organized that way, and my husband, Dave, and Jessica, they wanted to still hold it. So I got my first Christmas of sitting in the, at the couch, not doing anything, <laughs> <laughs> being waited on. I mean, I was sore, mm -hmm. of course, and things like that, but yeah, it was so nice to be home for Christmas. So now we say that I've been given the best Christmas present that yes. I could have ever been given in the year 2009. So now I am nice and healthy. Three months later, I looked for work and found a job. I don't have problems so much with my kidney. Of course, mm -hmm. I have to take more medication because you have to take it for a rejection. Um, I'm more social now because I get to go out more, things like yes. that. So I am good to go now. So throughout all of that, who kept you, helped you to keep your spirits up? I think a lot of it has to be family and friends that I had, especially family, because they would call and see, well, you know, how are you doing? And things like that. Um, I would definitely have to stay, say near the end it would be my younger brother Richard and my husband Dave because both of them did go to try and be a living donor for me. Unfortunately they were both rejected mm. but I mean that's something that you know I was like wow it's it's great for them to know that they were thinking enough of me to go through that. Yeah and things course. like that so yeah through that and I mean just uh, trying to keep my spirits up and, and knowing through faith that it's not the end of the world, that you know there are options for me down the road and that things will get better. So now you're working. Yep. And what's ahead for you? Well, I'm going to continue working full time. I'm going to continue to meet more women and have a good time and have fun. I do continue on my medications. I continue to go in for my regular checkups to make sure everything's okay. I do volunteer. We have a little group here in Oxford to bring awareness for um, uh, tissue and donor awareness to mm -hmm. people to register for uh, donor 
So I do a little bit of that, and who knows what else will happen. <laughs> Well, that's a wonderful story. In fact, that's a true good news story and a Merry Christmas story and all yep. of that. What would you like our viewers to take away from your story, Christine? First of all, look after yourself. Because if you don't, it's pretty hard to look after everyone else. Um, through the long run, we found out it might have been my blood pressure that was a primary function of my kidneys going downhill. So get your blood pressure checked. <laughs> I mean, why not yeah. go for checkups? It's a good thing. If you have a, a, an instinct that there's maybe something wrong with yourself, go and see your doctor. We live in Ontario. There's no reason that we couldn't. <laughs> right? um, reach out to family and friends. If you do have some kind of health issue, try and stay positive about it because it certainly helps in the long run that you do. And research, make sure you know what it is that you can or find out from other people and have the backup of your family is certainly helpful. And lastly, I guess, would be because I like people to know about the awareness is think about registering to be a donor. You can go to www.beadonor.ca. <laughs> <laughs> Only takes a couple of minutes. If the family hadn't have done that for me, I don't know where I'd be right now. I would, well, I do. I'd be on dialysis, not working, being at home probably, mm -hmm. and not, and depressed, I would think, so. Would you like to say that website for us again, Christine, so that sure. people will be Sure, a little slower, <laughs> I know, I was trying to sneak it in there. It is www.beadonor.ca. Great, well that's just a terrific suggestion, and we can sure see how you're the beneficiary of the goodwill of that family. And we're so glad that you are and I'm very, very glad you were able to be with us today and share your story. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you for giving me the invitation to do so. And now I do feel like I am a woman of courage. <laughs> you absolutely are, Christine. And now we're gonna have a word from Jezebel. Jezebel Peppa is going to give us a word of inspiration. Peppa here. Darlings, do you go to work every day and feel like a hamster on a wheel? Or do you love what you do? If you're not excited to get up out of bed every day and go to work, I have some advice for you. Think about what you're passionate about. If money were no object, if you couldn't fail, what would you spend your time doing? Think about it, because that's where your seeds of greatness will be sown. Think about what you're passionate about and ask the universe to take you there. Don't worry about how it will happen, just know that it will. It has to, you're fantastic. Celebrate your passion, and remember to celebrate the Jezebel in you. Hi and welcome to Oxford County Living. We are bringing to you news, sports and entertainment from right here in your Oxford County each and every week. Mr. Sherman was discharged on compassionate grounds from the forces. Then we have Auxiliary Sergeant Debbie Klemp. She's an active supporter and volunteer with minor hockey in the city for the past 20 years. Is there a different name other than your own for the band? Yeah, our band's name is Jackson Lane. Saturdays at 1.30, only on Rogers TV. Here's a self-defense technique you can learn in less than a minute. We like to call this a lapel grab or a tough guy grab. Someone grabs you. Well, first thing I need to do is I need to make, get him a little closer to me. He could be pretty tall, could be pretty long armed. So I'm gonna take my one hand and I'm gonna drop it on the top side of his elbow, on the inside of his arm. My other hand is gonna come up, striking him in the chin using the palm of my hand. You try to do this in one simple motion. So it's strike, pull him in. I pull him towards me. From here, I'm gonna grab a hold of his chin. Circling his head in a circle towards the floor, controlling him to the ground, push off and make some space. We're gonna try that one more time, a little quicker this time. So he grabs, strike, turn his head, drop him to the floor, push off, make some space. There's one more tip to help keep you safe. If I were Remember, in every setback lies opportunity. Opportunity for you to call up all that you have learned through personal experience and from others. 
to rely on your core beliefs and values, to find your way to new opportunities, and succeed in spite of everything. That I could not fail If I believed Would the wind Always fill up my sail How far would I go What could I achieve Trusting the hero in me If I were brave I'd walk the razor's edge where fools and dreamers dare to tread and never lose faith even when losing my way what step would i take today if i were brave What we secretly dream What would you ask if you knew You could have anything Like the mighty oak sleeps In the heart of a seed Are there miracles in you and me? If I were brave I'd walk the Call the Rogers TV viewer response line at 519-660-7548 or email us with your comments. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join us in an act of remembrance. Young people who maybe don't have the supports in their community definitely will drop out because they don't see education as a valuable tool. When young people come to the club and they're a part of the Rogers Raising the Grade, you have adult mentors that can cheer on young people and encourage them daily to do their best. Education is key to your potential. Young people, if they succeed in education, can succeed.